I'm Phil Bleasy. This is my Morgan three-wheeler. Welcome to my Morgan three-wheeler workshop, which is a YouTube channel which contains videos which will help you to understand what makes these things tick. It will also help you to carry out routine maintenance and servicing tasks, minor repairs, and it explains all about the upgrades that I make for the drivetrain. I make an upgrade for the cush drive on the crankshaft, the centre cush drive. I make an upgrade for the bevel box mountings and I also make a chain drive conversion for the back end. These I install for you or you can come and work with me in my workshops and we'll install them together. If you want to see all the rest of my videos, more hints and tips and little bits and pieces you can carry out to improve the vehicle and to improve your Morgan three-wheeler experience, then please go down to the bottom of the page or just below this video, click on the subscribe button or if you don't want to do that, just remember the words Morgan Three Wheeler Workshop and put them in the search engine at the top. That'll get you to this channel. Otherwise, you might like to look at my website, which is www.bleasy.co.uk. Enjoy your experience. Happy three wheelering. Bye. Welcome to another of my videos at the Morgan Three Wheeler Workshop. This is the uh, much talked about bevel box. This takes a drive from the gearbox via a short prop shaft that sits in here and I can't even turn this one over. Transmits the drive to a toothed belt to the back wheel. In many vehicles it has been mounted in a thing called the NVH kit, the Noise, Vibration and Harshness kit. The reason for the kit being fitted is that this thing winds, makes quite a lot of noise and the designers thought that that noise might be reduced by isolating the gearbox from the chassis because in the Morgan three-wheeler, when you sit in the cockpit, <coughs> you are inside the chassis. And so whining noise transmitted by this thing would be greater. I don't actually think that this thing reduces any whining whatsoever. I've been in vehicles where the bevel box is still mounted on the welded-in mountings, welded into the chassis, and I don't think they're any noisier. What this thing does do it introduces an element of flexibility which causes some serious problems. So let's look at the geometry of it first of all. The original mounting was here with two bolts going down into the chassis. That has been replaced by this great big long arm which is welded up out of bits of pressed steel angle and with reinforcing braces and all sorts of other bits and pieces but terminates in two rubber vibration reducing bushes. These fit just underneath the gearbox. Great big long bolts holding them in. At the back we had two bolts going in here and here holding the bevel box to a bracket which is welded to the chassis. That welded bracket has been taken off and this crossways beam, again, welded up out of bits of pressed angle iron and all sorts of brackets and shaped things, clamps here and on this side as well to clamp it to the chassis. And again, where this bolt goes in here, one of those metalastic vibration reducing rubber bushes. Now the first thing we need to note about the geometry of this is that here we have two rubber bushes which are nothing more nor less, especially if they're a bit worn out or if the bolts are loose, they are nothing more nor less than a hinge which allows this to happen. That is held down by this great long arm at the front. Now let's look at the forces that come to play. First of all, when we turn 
the input shaft we are using a pinion to drive around a crown wheel inside the gearbox. This is attached to that crown wheel. The force is revolving the crown wheel in this direction. There will of course be an equal and opposite force which is trying to lift the front of the gearbox in that direction. Two opposing forces. Fact of nature, you cannot escape it. So the full driving force of that two liter engine shoving you down the road to 60 mile an hour in six seconds or whatever the figure is, all of that force is lifting the front of this bubble box, pulling that up. That's number one. Now let us look at the belt. Ignore the fact that the belt is being turned by something rotary. We've already spoken about the rotary force. Now let's just think about the tension in that top run of the belt. It is pulling the top of the rear wheel pulley forwards in order to propel the vehicle down the road. And the equal and opposite force, and there always is one, is pulling this backwards. That belt is in tension, it's being stretched. One end is pulling the wheel forward, this end is pulling the bevel box backwards. If we pull backwards up here, with a hinge down here, similarly, we're going to, can't even lift it, lift this thing up. I did some small experiments with various alternative mountings <coughs> at the front here. I used a 50 millimeter diameter rubber mounting underneath the nose of the box here which was fail safe had steel plates on either side I didn't even get to the end of the road before it turned one of those steel plates into a mushroom the force lifting this is enormous the result of that is that this beam being as long as it is is not well enough fixed to the front of the gearbox it flexes I can give you an idea of how much it flexes. If we look at another one of these things, this is an earlier one. You can probably see here, it has bent it to the point that the two bits of plate welded together here have delaminated. You'll see that this plate at the front here is seriously deformed. So we have a situation where the front of this bevel box can rise up and surely if you put a crowbar underneath it and lever it against the chassis you can make it move. When you accelerate really hard this thing lifts up and puts the entire thing into tension almost, almost like the prod on a crossbow until such time as the back wheel loses traction when you, for example, run over a little bit of gravel or maybe a wet patch in the road, a bit of mud, anything. If you're accelerating hard and you lose that tiny bit of traction, the front of this thing comes down with a bang that is scary. My machine in the early days would do it three times in a row. If you kept your foot down, it would go bang, bang, bang. Most unpleasant. It's all because this thing allows the front of the box to rise. The other thing that happens is when you're in a higher gear, if you're in, for example, fourth gear, accelerating through 3000 RPM, the firing strokes of the engine, those, those torque spikes everybody talks about, are transmitted back here to this gearbox and the front of the gearbox goes up and down in resonance with the engine. Bom, 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 bom. Some people I've met thought that that was natural and you had to drive around it, changing gear to make sure you didn't actually have the engine at 3000 RPM while you were accelerating in the higher gears. Really, I don't think that's the right answer. The right answer is to mount this thing properly. The best thing you could possibly do 
is to have an original chassis with the original welded in mountings to hold the thing properly in place securely. If yours, like so many, has had this modification done, those mountings will have been ground out roughly with an angle grinder and to replace them will involve you in A, making the brackets and B, welding in situ near petrol tanks, petrol pipes. I don't think that is a satisfactory solution. And so I'm about to show you my solution which holds this thing down securely goes some way to isolating the vibration, the screaming, whining noise that this thing makes from the chassis and doesn't require any welding. I'll take this lot apart now, put my set on and talk to you again. Back so here we are then. This is my upgrade. I should explain to you something that I missed out while we had this thing mounted in the MVH kit was that what happened in my case was that the rear wheel sprocket being made of aluminium wore out steadily over a period of several thousand miles. This caused the drive belt to become a little slacker. That caused me great confusion because at first I thought because the belt was always becoming slack it was jumping over the teeth on the sprocket. Absolutely not. They don't jump over the teeth any more than the chain will until they're absolutely knackered. What confused me was the fact that when I took it back to the dealer they just tightened the belt and the problems went away. The reason the problems went away is that this top run of the belt whilst it on the one hand being one of the forces which tries to lift this bevel box up. You'll notice I can lift it now. It also prevents, when the bevel box has come up, it prevents it, when you lose traction, from coming down again. Bang! That's how the problem is overcome. And I can tell you that in all cases, people are running their belts much too tight. Those belts don't need to be that tight. They need some slack in the middle. If you want to see the correct tensioning procedure, look at a Harley Davidson website where they show you a little spring balance to check the amount of weight. And most of the bikes are fitted with a little meter that tells you how far the belt has moved for a specific weight. And I can tell you it is much slacker than the way most more than three wheelers are run. If you slacken your belt off, and if there's in any, in, in, any sort of slackness in that MVH kit, then the banging will start. Anyway, on to my kit. Three mountings, one at the front, one at the back, one at the top. The front mounting, what you will note, is stepped forward from the mounting bolts that go through the bevel box, these. You have to step it forward, or oh, you don't have to, I step it forward, because directly underneath these you will find the residue of the old mountings that were ground off with the angle grinder when the MVH kit was fitted. And you certainly don't want to be going in there with the angle grinder with petrol pipes close by. Far better just to leave them where they are. Secondly, directly under there, are the seat belt mountings. I don't think the Ministry would be very pleased if they found that you were carrying out welding around a seat belt mounting without proper testing afterwards. So I bring this forward. It avoids the remains of the old mounting, the welded in one, and gives you a clean piece of chassis to clamp onto. This little bridge at the front is well strong enough to take the forces that are created inside this bubble box. At the back, a similar situation. The old mounting plate was wider. There are welds here on the chassis 
this is narrow enough to fit in between the welds. I can already hear you ask, <coughs> asking you the question, how do you get that drain plug out? There is enough room on there to get a socket spanner on. Let's turn it round again. Give you another look at the other side. There's the front. People who did the machining for me very kindly put my name on it. Now we come to the belt and braces aspect of the job. The top mounting. Forces in this gearbox, as we've said, try to lift the front up. So I figured that any help we could get, and there are a pair of chassis members running across the vehicle, which are braced together to make a formidably strong support member. It holds the top of the seat belts, for example. This little thing can be slid up and down. It has a jacking screw. So the idea is, having got these boys tightened up and the thing all in position, you then just wind that jacking screw up to take all the play out of here give it another half a turn just to put a little bit of tension in, do up the clamp bolts, that gearbox is never going to move again. You'll notice that I have little red polyurethane liners inside all the clamps. I don't feel it's a very good idea to be clamping onto a chassis tube and creating little areas of stress at the edges of the clamps. And I also feel that there may well be some merit in isolating the high frequency whining noise of this thing from the chassis. Although I don't think that's very important to be truthful, but I do it anyway. So there you are, it takes about five hours to fit. And if and if you look if you look elsewhere on this channel, more than three-wheeler workshop, you'll find all the instructions on how to remove the MVH kit, how to throw it in the bin and how to install all of these mountings. Your life will be more pleasurable having done so. Thanks very much for your patience. See you again soon. Bye.